Okay, go ahead. Okay, we have to say it again. Good evening, everyone. I am Mark Anthony Massaro, the time traveling artist. And tonight I'm going to be talking to you about pigment and from roughly the seventh century to the present, the evolution of oil paint and how it all came about. Now, to get started, we have to talk about just how far back um, man has been experimenting with color. Now, um, prehistoric man, cavemen, we know this from uh, you know, cave drawings and that kind of thing, they were already experimenting and trying to figure out how to make their art colorful. And they would usually grind up anything that they could find, uh, minerals, plants, flowers, uh, anything that they found that they could grind up into a powder, mix with water, and it would in turn create paint. And we see this in the cave paintings and, and, and a variety of other things as, as man starts to progress. Now, one of the things that has always troubled prehistoric man and, and also through antiquity, if we go through uh, Egyptian times and the Greeks and the Romans, and everything else, in their art, color fastness was a big issue. Uh, whether it was in textiles and clothing that they were trying to put color into, or if it was uh, their artwork, there was always a problem with the, the pigment fading, okay? And uh, through trial and error, uh, eventually they discovered how to make colors color fast. And we have, we have evidence as far back as the Egyptians that they used ammonia to make their colors stay in fabric. Now, you may ask, well, where did the Egyptians get ammonia? Urine. And I shudder to think of how this actually was discovered. My guess is that in their clothing, as it maybe got soiled, they discovered that, gee, these parts of the garments aren't fading. <laughs> There's something in the urine that makes the, the colors color fast. And for a very long time, uh, you know, through the centuries, I mean, even in as far as into the, into the 14th, 15th, 16th century, 17th century, um, urine was used to make colors color fast, to keep them from fading. Another thing they used also uh, were um, metallic salts. And what metallic salts are uh, is like um, uh, silver nitrate and, and lead and that kind of thing. We know that you've probably heard of this where uh, in, in Roman times and in, and in Egyptian times, women made makeup out of, uh, out of you know, lead and pigment and applied it to their faces, which was deadly. I mean, that, you know, it, would, it would cause skin cancer and that kind of thing, but they didn't know this. But these are things that would make uh, uh, colors color fast. Now, when we talk about, you know, where, where does pigment come from? You know, literally pigment comes from, from everywhere and anywhere that you look, okay? Um, in, uh, as, as paint starts to develop and we start coming through the centuries, uh, man starts to, uh, you know, it, grind up all types of things, precious stones, uh, uh, different ores and minerals, rust, all types of things that they could grind into a powder. If it was vegetable or flower base or that kind of thing, berries, that kind of thing, how that was done was everything is sort of ground up into a paste and then it's left to dry. And then after it dries, they, they pulverize it even further and, um, and then would mix it with water, okay? Now, before the occurrence of oil paint, really the only vehicle that was used to create paint was water, right? Another uh, thing was egg tempera, okay? Now, I'll get into what that is but in, in a minute, but the first evidence that we have of 
oil paint existing is as far back as the seventh century. And it is um, Buddhist artists in Afghanistan. And we have found artifacts where there's an oil content in paint that is on pottery and a variety of other things, but it was extremely unsophisticated and it probably didn't last all that long. The next evidence we have of oil paint existing is in the 12th century in Europe. And that's when we start to see pigment being mixed in with different types of oils in order to create paint. Now, the big turnaround, the, the, the big um, advancement in paint has to do with why I am dressed the way I'm dressed tonight. Because as we get into the 13th and the 14th century, which is essentially where the dawning of the Renaissance, this is where the, um, the technology and experimentation starts to become more sophisticated. And it's how artists will start to use paints literally from the Renaissance all the way up to the end of the 19th century. Now, um, an important person in society at this time, 12th, 13th, 14th century, is the chemist. He is the one that produces pigment. And artists who were, who were professional in, in their fields, um, would always have apprentices. And these were people that young, young people, 99% uh, of the time they were, they were men, um, young boys who showed promise in art and that wanted a career in art would be put into the apprenticeship of a master. And the master would delegate all of this, uh, all of these, these uh, things that they needed to do in order for the artist to prepare every day to paint, okay? So they would, he would send an apprentice to the chemist and he would request whatever pigments he needed, okay? And again, these pig, pigments could be made out of a variety of different minerals and ores and, and plant life. And they would usually come in a small sort of waxed paper or parchment sort of folder or envelope. And these would be brought back to the studio and the, the apprentice had to prepare the paints for the master every single day. And that occurred by putting measured amounts of pigment into one of these and whatever appropriate oil that the, the master requested, which could be linseed oil, poppy seed oil, walnut oil, a whole variety of different oils that all have different properties to them as far as how they dry and it would the paint would literally have to be ground into a consistency and a paste that resembles what you use as oil painters today you think about how much work had to be done every single day in order to do this okay now another development with oil painting is the solvents and through trial and error turpentine starts to become available to artists and turpentine is there's there's two types there's wood terps and there's gum terps wood terp is where they take rotting or dead pine and it's and it's steamed distilled and that's where they get the turpentine out of it and if you've ever used wood terps, I actually forbid students to bring wood terps because it's still available. They may still make it. Uh, wood terp has a, a, an astounding odor that can cause the most amazing sort of chemical headache. I usually don't let students use wood terps. The other common turpentine that most artists use is gum turpentine. And gum turpentine, again, from a pine tree is the same way they make maple syrup. The tree is tapped and they get the sap and the sap is distilled and you get turpentine and the turpentine acts as a solvent to the oil it breaks it down 
and this is how artists would thin their paints out and clean their brushes, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is how artists are working now in the Renaissance. Okay. Now, um, we'll just get back to, to uh, water and tempera. Let's talk about that before we go, before we go into the advancement of oil paint. So tempera is where they would mix water with the pigment in order to produce artwork. Egg tempera is still used today. There are still artists that work in egg tempera and it is a extremely durable surface. It literally is the yellow, the yolk of an egg, which you dip your brush into and mix it into the pigment and then you paint with it. There are egg tempera paintings that are as vibrant and as beautiful as the day they were done in the 12th and 13th century that exists today. It, it, is, it is a profoundly durable surface for something that is all natural. There's not real any, any sort of uh, produced chemicals to, to make egg tempera. Um, and it, as I said, it is a very, very durable surface. Um, the other application of tempera, which is the uh, putting water into pigment, mixing it up to create paint. And that is where it's a, uh, applied to fresco painting. And fresco painting in the 13th and 14th century was the process where the artist's staff, his apprentices, would trowel plaster of Paris onto a wooden surface and even it out and get it completely smooth. While it was still damp, artwork was transferred to it as far as the drawing process. And then the artist would proceed to paint with his tempera paint onto the plaster. And what happens is the plaster absorbs the paint and it literally makes a layered painting. A perfect example of a fresco painting is the Sistine Chapel. And uh, bring up the picture of that in a second. Okay. So we are all familiar with this. All of this, this entire astounding piece of work is all fresco. It is the process where the drawing is done on plaster that is wet or damp and then the artist has to get in there and work really fast. So that's what makes this such a work of genius by Michelangelo is because this had to be painted at an astounding rate in order to get it into, into the plaster and to have it set. And again, one of the interesting things about a fresco is that if you sand it, you can't sand the painting off. The tempera is permeates the plaster, goes right to the bottom of it, which is pretty amazing. But then now the oil paint starts coming into, in, in, into play. Now, this is probably not only the most famous Renaissance painting in the world, but probably one of the most famous paintings in the world. Everybody knows this painting. Everybody knows who painted it. But I would say the majority of the time, if I were to ask people who were not schooled in, in art history and who are not artists themselves, if I said to them, I want you to close your eyes and imagine Leonardo da Vinci painting the Mona Lisa, tell me what you see. And the person might say, well, the woman is probably sitting there and the artist is sitting at his easel and he has all of his brushes and he has all of his tubes of paint. <clears throat> no. 